A good life is a life built around fulfilling work, play, relationships, and lifelong learning. Welcome to Good Life Conversations, where we explore the stories and strategies of inspiring everyday people who are striving to create a life of purpose, meaning, and connection. Hi there, and welcome to this Good Life Conversation. My name is Jay. I'm your host and the founder of Discovery Year. And today's guest is Spencer Mandy. Welcome, Spencer. Hey, Jay. So Spencer is the vice president and general manager at a really cool company called Canadian Banknote. And perhaps he'll tell you a little bit more about what they do at Canadian Banknote. But just to kick things off, Spencer and I met probably about five years ago now. I think. And, and we met at an event where Spencer had hired me to come in and facilitate a team building event for, for his staff at the Canadian bank note. And I remember very specifically, I can see the room and the way that the event started off often, it would be me that would start things off at those events. But Spencer was taking the time uh, with his team of about 20 people. He was taking the time to ask them. It was at one of their, their team retreats and he was asking them all questions and they were having a conversation for about 30 minutes. And what stood out to me was the way Spencer interacted with his teams. I, I know a lot of managers, a lot of leaders. I work with many different people and it was really remarkable, the skills, mostly active listening skills and curiosity to connect with his team. So we got to chatting after that and, and Spencer's history was really, really interesting. And um, he's a great example of how to use a lot of the leadership skills that we that we help our students develop at Discovery Year. So he's been doing this for a number of years now. So th thanks for doing it again, Spencer. My pleasure. And what I'd love to start with, same question for everyone is, tell us about a typical day. So our students are, are, are often, you know, not used to the professional world yet. So it's helpful for them to hear, you know, how other professionals, what time do you get up? Do you have a morning routine? You know, how much time do you spend at work? And how do you wind down your day? What time do you go to bed? Just give us a little bit of, a, of an idea of what your day looks like. Well, uh, these days it's uh, it's an early rise, somewhere between five and six. Um, I don't ever start the day looking at my phone. That's a relatively new practice, I would say, in the last decade because I think we're overconnected in my personal experience. Um, so I start the day with a quick workout, whether that's well, it can be a heavy workout too. But I like working out in the morning, so it's uh, it's initially you know break a sweat and and do something for myself and my body. Because uh, I find that balance is is critical. So the phone's only used for some music uh, or timings in a workout, and then I'll uh, I'll get on with the day. Hit the office by somewhere around eight. First hour is usually you know personal and professional administration, and then it's just back to back meetings. And you know I'm I'm trying to be very conscious though that uh, through the day you do take your own personal breaks, or I do, um, you know breath work, moments of quiet. Um, the days can just be so overwhelming and all consuming that uh, I certainly notice that that uh, those moments of quiet become critical to success for me anyway. Hmm. Shut down by about five, five thirty unless you know there's something critical or or uh, emergencies type thing, fires to fight that are happening. Um, and then uh, it's what I call a recovery program in the evening, you know, just to recover from the day. So it's uh, time for family and, uh, you know, nice dinner and uh, and then usually in bed by 9 30, 10 o'clock. And uh, again, similar to, to the mornings, no screens for about an hour. I find that's helped my sleep dramatically. Hmm. Very cool. Thank you. A lot, a lot of follow up questions are in my mind. One I would, one I, I would like to hone, hone in on is this idea you mentioned, hey, it could be overwhelming uh, the day. So many things to do, so many people to meet. And I'm curious because a lot of our young people that, you know, in Discovery Year and other young people in general are feeling a lot of overwhelm today. So you mentioned taking kind of personal time or, you know, quiet time. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that is for you and how you learned to do that? Mm. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I got a point to a point in my life um, somewhere between, you know, seven and 10 years ago where uh, things were just out of control. I, I, and, and I had to learn in order to um, maintain my path of, of uh, you know, functional success, if you want to call it that, I had to learn how to take some time back for myself. I was giving it all away. I thought that I had to give it all away to obtain success, whatever that definition is. And um, so I, I had to learn in some ways the hard way to, to really make space for myself during those overwhelming moments. It's okay to take a breath. It's okay to not have all the answers. 
And frankly, it's okay and necessary to take a step back and, and take a deep breath, literally. Um, so I, I, you know, and, and there's thousands of years of breath work practice that, you know, young people can, can get themselves educated on, but it's literally as simple as just closing a door, taking time for yourself, making some space and realizing that everything's going to work out. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Thank you. So one thing that always comes to mind for me when we're talking, and this topic of, you know, overwhelm and burnout and work-life balance and making space for yourself, these are really popular topics in general for good reason, especially with young people. And what I've experienced is that a lot of young people are in the process of figuring that out. What's too much mm -hmm. time for others? What's too much time for me? Or how do, how do I find a, a good balance? So one thing that I would love to ask you is someone who, you know, I know you just returned from a, a trip around the world for business. You know, you were in Japan and New Zealand and other parts of Asia. And um, so obviously you do a lot and you are very good at what you do. And I, I also would like to ask you about the skills that young people you're looking for in young people, because I think there's this balance uh, where we want young people to work hard and also help them learn to not be overwhelmed. So tell us a little mm. bit about that. What are you looking for in young people? And how do you how do you see when they've achieved a good balance of work ethic and and self-care? Well, that's a that, that's a big question. Um, so I think one of the things I look for foremost in young people is authenticity. One of the things that that I developed a little later in life that I wish I had developed earlier was a was a pure, authentic, true, honest relationship with myself, um, with who I am, with my faults, with my shortcomings, with my strengths, you know. Oftentimes I've learned, at least for me um, and most of my staff that I'm familiar with, it, you know, our greatest strengths can often be our, our greatest weaknesses. And having that recognition and being able to have those honest conversations with yourself will go a long, long way in you're, you know, really, really developing the most authentic version of yourself that you can bring to not just your personal life, but also to the workplace, you know, so that work life balance that you talk about, that's what we need from people in the workplace, whether you're an entrepreneur, or, you know, an executive or a worker or whatever, whatever you decide to do, bring your true authentic self to that and, uh, and things will go very well for you. Mm hmm. And just just from a like a simplistic number standpoint, let's say, mm -hmm. what do you what are your typical expectations for a young person coming into your team or your organization? Like how many hours a week do you like people to work? What do you think is acceptable? How do you know when they're when they're working working hard enough for your standards? Yeah, that that's a really good question. You know, I, I have a general rule myself, and then I'll talk a little bit about how we as an organization have dealt with some of this. As I mentioned, I think we're we're an overconnected world, you know, it's, it's not like the old days when you and I started up, <laughs> you know, cell phones exist. Now you're connected all the time. You're always getting emails, but the reality is for me, if the work's getting done, I'm okay with how much effort you're putting in because you're putting in enough effort for, for the job to be accomplished. So if objectives are getting completed, if your teammates see you as a, a contributing factor to that objective, um, then it's not really about timeline for me. Um, different people learn in different learn and work in different ways. Um, so we really try, I really try, and we as an organization really try to create an environment that allows um, all types of capacity uh, from all types of people. Um, so that being said, we do actually have a disconnect policy um, here with our organization. I think they're becoming a little more popular in larger organizations. And so, you know, a normal work day is nine to five. We're expecting you to take breaks through the day and we expect you to be available during times when you need to be available to accomplish whatever the objective is. Um, that being said, we'll also be the first ones, you know, if you run into a family problem or a personal problem, we want to be able to support you and you need to take the time you need to take in order to address those, those things in your personal life. Yeah. Great. So a lot of and I would just, I would just add Jay, if an organization isn't willing to do that for you as an individual, then they're probably not an organization worth working for, especially in the long term. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, this is something that we we often get to a little bit later, but because you you already started off by kind of sharing your thoughts on screen time and what that can do, I'd love for you to share because you know, like you said, you and I didn't 
grow up with a smartphone in our hands and young people do nowadays. And that is here to stay, uh, we would probably believe. So when you started disconnecting, tell us about the benefits that you experienced from that. How did that change things for you? What, what did you gain from it? Oh, wow. All kinds of things. I didn't even realize some of the impact not disconnecting was having. One of the biggest sort of surprises for me was, was actually my overall, I'll call it mental health, but really just about overall positivity. You know, my mental health, I didn't feel like I was in competition with every Instagram post and every Facebook post or every email that was coming through on, on work or personal. I, I just, it didn't matter anymore. Right. And I, I started to feel, I think the word would be lighter. I just started to feel better about everything. And when I did address, um, you know, whether it was any of the social media or work stuff, I, I had a much clearer mind to address it. And I just felt uh, in a much better, more positive place. Um, as I mentioned before, my sleep improved. Um, my feeling of stress diminished dramatically. I didn't feel like I was constantly in this fight or flight sort of um, gut feeling. I felt like I had literally disconnected and that it was okay. And here was the biggest revelation is when I did reconnect, it was all still there to go back to. I didn't miss anything. <laughs> yeah. So that was great. Yeah, amazing. And, and on this topic, one of the questions we like to ask about hobbies, and, and I, I, if you don't mind, I'm not going to give you entire freedom here, because I know that one of your hobbies is going out into the bush, going out into the, into the forest. And I think that's connected to what we're talking about here. And I suspect that there's some connection between that experience for you and, and being on your computer or your phone. So knowing that that's a hobby and feel free to tell us other hobbies too, but what, what do you, what do you do when you go out into the woods? Tell us a little bit about that, that hobby. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, so this is, you know, I grew up in the woods, typical, you know, Ottawa Valley guy that would, you know, car camp on the weekends with his family growing up. Um, so I've always had a connection to nature. But I think um, as I grew older, uh, I lost that connection a little bit, you know, other things became priority, like finding work or developing a career or achieving that next career position. Um, and I lost sight of a lot of things. And then when my kids were born, um, I kind of got reminded um, that I need to reconnect. And so now my kids are grown. And frankly, it's, it's, for me anyways, something that um, I have to do in order to stay healthy, right? Um, I've traveled to over 70 plus countries in my career. And I always come back to Canada. Um, and like you mentioned, specifically to the back country or into the mountains. And um, I feel like we, I certainly did, and I think I can speak for most of our society these days, I hope, that, you know, I think we've lost connection with the roots. And at the end of the day, no matter where I've been in the world, those roots um, really are a connection with the natural world. And we've really, I think in general, we've lost, lost that connection. And so for me, we're meant to spend time in the wilderness. You know, we're, we're meant to reconnect, to slow down, to breathe, to listen to what's happening around us. I mean, I would really encourage anybody watching, get out into the woods and just close your eyes and see what you hear or hear what you hear, you know, because um, you're going to hear things that you forgot were even there or that you've never discovered before. And what it allows you to do is is just let go of the chaos of daily living in society and, and really just get recentered, which I find absolutely critical. Very cool. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> it's a theme that we talk about. And in fact, part of the reason I wanted to ask you about it is because our students often will make this connection uh, because during a discovery year, they have perhaps more time or give themselves more freedom to get out into nature as compared to their normal kind of everyday life at, at school or whatever it is. So people do realize the utility of it. And I think we need more people to share the message because even though we recognize it intellectually, a lot of people still have difficulty making that time or, or finding mm -hmm. the place to go and, and uh, prioritizing it. So um, well, I think you. you said something very important there, making the time, you know, and that's what you have to do. It, it becomes a conscious practice. Um, and I can tell you as you know, if I put the employer hat on, I would much rather a connected, centered, peaceful person coming to work every day because they're going to contribute to the team that much more effectively than somebody who's coming in on the verge of burnout all the time. And so I try to promote within our team, and it certainly is culturally within the company, 
that if you need time for yourself, please ask for it. And I don't think anybody should ever be afraid uh, to make time for themselves in that way. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Speaking of the uh, of the company, I think that certainly when we met, I had no idea that Canadian Banknote existed, nor that it was in Ottawa and the kind of the magnitude and importance of work that you do. So I'd love for you to just tell, you know, kind of a brief description of some of the cool things that uh, that you all do at Canadian Banknote. Sure. So Canadian Banknote is a Canadian owned company. It's a private company and uh, it was started in 1897. So we've been around a little while it started as a small company printing posted stamps and other security type documents including currencies and um, we've been canada's currency printer since the bank of canada was formed in 1935 and uh, we're currently at about 2200 employees worldwide um, we participate actively in six strategic markets uh, including currency obviously uh, border control, which includes all the Canadian passports, the newly released one, go get yours today. Um, the, uh, the, all the systems behind that for issuance and personalization, um, and many of the civil identification documents. So driver's licenses, birth and death certificates, things of that nature, and then all the issuance and traceability systems that go behind that and also excise control. So, you know, all of, uh, all of some of our I, I would say less healthier products, uh, namely tobacco and cannabis, is controlled through a program that we deliver to the federal government. Yeah, so much. It, and and I think I would be bet that the overwhelming majority of Canadians had no idea that it's not, in fact, the Bank of Canada who makes our our notes, our currency. No, no. Yeah. no it's, a, it's always been a, a little company just down the road. <laughs> So cool. And and um, I don't think you you mentioned here, but like, uh, of course, we, you do these things for Canadian markets for, for, for Canadians, but also internationally. You mentioned that Absolutely. briefly you're in different areas. Yeah. On any given year, we'll have presence uh, somewhere around 80 countries around the world yeah. doing various things. Yeah, well, I think it's pretty cool that a Canadian company is the one who has this expertise by and large in, in such a, a huge percentage of the world. So I was happy to learn about it. Yeah, it, it, and we've kept a low profile sort of by design, right? Where our objective is to make the world a safer place through the markets that we participate in. Um, we are part of national, uh, Canada's national security infrastructure, obviously. And, um, um, you know, we're, it, it, it's a great company that's maintained all our manufacturing in Canada, and we employ a, a good number of Canadians. So we're a very proudly Canadian company. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you. And, and we didn't talk much, uh, nor will, uh, will I think we have much time for it, but you have a background in the military. And so I think it's one of the things that's great about uh, all of our mentors, many of our mentors, they have these varied career paths. And so mm -hmm. if you may, how did you make a transition from being in the military? Like, what did you take from that? That was eventually got you a job at Canadian Bank? No, what are the skills? How did you do that? Because I think a lot of our audience would think military, you know, making mm -hmm. money, literally <laughs> making money. How does how does that connection work? Um, well, I, I think for me, my experience, the military was a wonderful experience. Um, it's not everybody's path, but it certainly gave me uh, a level of discipline and structure that I certainly didn't have before the military. I've carried that forward through the rest of my career. And as I was transitioning out of the military, um, uh, it was, you know, early 2000s and I had uh, landed just a you know, entry level sales job at a, a technology firm that was doing network maintenance. And that technology firm had a client called the Canadian Banknote that ended up on my desk. And so Canadian Banknote was initially a client and through just positive relationships and a good experience on both sides, um, I ended up here in 2006 and uh, planned to plan to round out the career here, ideally, if they keep me, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, obviously, I mean, you landed there in 2006. I assume you were not, you didn't land there as the VP and general manager. Uh, so you've you've done some really good things, I imagine, to to get to the place where you are now. Um, 
I won't ask you what those are because I know you're a humble guy, but uh, maybe when you meet with our students, they might be interested in learning. What do you think that you did to uh, kind of be promoted and to and to gain higher uh, positions? But I would like you, you touched on the importance of relationships as part of a segue from from your former company to this company. And mm-hmm. that's one of our questions. So I'd love for you to share uh, an important lesson or insight about relationships that you'd, you'd like to share with our audience. I think I go back to you know, one of your earlier questions, which is the, the, for me, what I've learned is, is the quality of the relationships you have personally and professionally is going to be a direct reflection of the quality of the relationship you have with yourself. So the earlier in life, you can figure out how to, how to have an honest, authentic relationship with yourself. All the answers in my experience are within. And so it's about, you know, getting to the hard stuff and it can be hard sometimes dealing with um, personal things um, that typically by nature we don't want to deal with or we avoid. And we may not even be conscious of the fact that we're avoiding them. But getting to that hard stuff early on in life, I think really sets you up to develop that true authentic capability. And once you put your true authentic self into the world, relationships come very, very naturally. And they become real uh, sincere, long-standing relationships that'll that'll serve you well throughout your life. Thank you. And yeah, so you mentioned, um, you know, the idea of coming to grips or confronting. You know, we all have challenges. You know, some seemingly mm-hmm. greater than others. But you mentioned the idea of confronting those early in life, and I'm I, I would love to know what helped you confront those challenges that you had. What was what was most useful for you to be able to do that and Perhaps what you learn in the process? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I think, you know, for me, I, I address these things a little bit later in life. I, I would have loved to have um, figured this out earlier, uh, but we all have our own path. Um, for me, it was frankly, you know, my, my personal life was falling apart. It was just, it was at a point where my marriage was over. My relationship with my kids wasn't nearly where I'd like it to be or where I thought it should be, frankly. And it took a a very uh, dark, personal, uh, honest, you know, journey into myself to figure out um, what was going wrong. And that's a that's that's a long, hard process. But it's probably the most worthwhile thing I've ever done in my life, beyond any professional success, um, was to figure that out. You know, and I'm happy to report them. The marriage survived it. I have a great relationship with my kids. I have two grandkids now. And, um, you know, life's actually never been better. So all I can pass on is is try to get to those really difficult conversations that everybody has to have with themselves. You're not alone in them. Um, and there's help out there. And there's lots of people who have been through it um, that want to pass on that, you know, their own journey to you. Um, and, and if you can come with an open heart, I guarantee good things will happen. Thank you. Yeah. And we were chatting before we started recording about the fact that this kind of culmination for you is when you were 42 years old. And I think yeah. that's important to share because a lot of young people today feel like they have, to have it all figured out when they're 18 or 20 or 21. And yeah. <clears throat> almost nobody does, really. Yeah. So I, I don't think inspiring. anybody does. You know, I think the truth is um, you might have some people who really may seem or think they they look like they do especially with social media these days everybody's leading their best life of course um i can tell you from personal experience that's not true you know all these people that are putting out um you know this perfect life is probably going through some really hard stuff that you never know what the story is behind the scenes the point i'm trying to make i guess is that journey is always inside it's always internal so Hmm. start there I love it. I, and that's one of the questions that we tend to ask, but we've already kind of covered it. And I think that for me, it's become a signal when I see certain behaviors or certain types of posts. We all have a different perspective of what should go on on social media, of course, and that's good, I think. But there are certain things that I see people doing in my first reaction, rather than it formally might be judgment, like, why are you doing that? My first reaction now is, ah, oh, that, that person's not doing well. And then the post is something obviously positive or how great they are, their situation. And my first reaction now is 
there's something that's that's off of that person. I feel for them because they're not doing well, probably. Yeah, yeah, I I would tend to share that view. Um, I made a rule a number of years ago, probably about ten years ago. I don't I don't typically post unless something's really profoundly impactful. Um, I just don't tend to post. I don't even tend to scroll. And if it is, it's on you know mundane stuff like how to build a shelter in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> but important, important. But important, you know. Yeah. But important, or or what's the next great canoe stroke? I don't know. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's you know, I, I tend to really limit my time on social media if I can. I I don't find it terribly uh, beneficial for me. Yeah, yeah, me too, me too. Um, okay, so one of the things that you mentioned way back at the beginning here was. 70 countries sounds like your I've been to over 50 and I've learned so much more through travel than I have almost any other mm -hmm. thing in life. And as you know, discover your part of the discover your program is a travel period. So, and I know you just came back and we were talking about Japan and how much you loved it. We had a couple of students go to mm -hmm. Japan. So uh, a couple of questions with respect to travel, been to 70 places, 70 countries. What's your favorite place to date? Canada. Ooh, tell me more. Um, so there are a lot of wonderful places in the world, um, but Canada, every time I come home, that's what it feels like. It feels like home. Um, you know, are we perfect? No. I mean, the political environment, we could have a whole other session on that. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, when I get out into the backcountry or skiing or into a mountain or whatever, um, the minute I'm able to reconnect with nature, um, there's no better place on the planet. And so for me, um, this is just where I need to be. It's where I need to be. I used to think I would go wherever my kids are, but I know this is the right place for me. So I'm hoping they'll continue if they travel abroad or whatever. I hope they come home. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Canada is my choice. Yeah, very cool. I, I, I feel that I, I eventually had a similar uh, kind of level of intuition about places I was visiting, I would know very quickly if it was a place that I'd want to go back to or not, because I did a lot of short trips on cruise ships. I would be in places very briefly and mm -hmm. I would have an instinct very quickly, you know, midway through that journey of you know, how many countries. So I appreciate that. I think I was uh, calculating a lot of data while I was doing that, but I, I also mm -hmm. came back here for, for that reason. And I'd love to know, and I'd love to our audience to benefit. What did you? What have you learned? I'm, I'm sure you've learned a ton from traveling, but what's one or two things that you've learned that were that are important to you? Um. Oh wow, traveling. So I started traveling when I was very young, but for me, um, two things I think are the biggest takeaways. One, the world is vast. There are so many different experiences to be had. At the same time, the world is exceptionally small and we are all connected um, and people are just that we're people. And so if you can find that human thread, um, you can survive and thrive anywhere in the world. Um, we're, we're meant we're social beings, as you know, Jay, this is your field of expertise. We're here to connect with each other and survive and thrive together. So um, traveling to me is just an opportunity really to see the people. It's, it's about understanding all the different ways, beautiful ways that exist on this planet to live. Very cool. What's your favorite other than Canada? Let's push it one just one step farther. The culture, the place, the lifestyle that you visited uh, as a second to Canada, where, where, would, where do you think you'd live? Um, this might sound like a boring answer, but New Zealand is very, very close to my heart. I've spent a lot of time there and it is very similar to Canada in a lot of ways. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's a wonderful outdoor culture there as well. Um, they're hardy, hardy hikers. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're, they're just hardy people who, uh, who really are connected to the land. And uh, that's something I appreciate. Um, but I've been, there's so many places. Um, Thailand's another favorite of mine, you know, um, the list goes on. Yeah, I mean, give me a backpack and you can find me in Europe or, or anywhere. There's something good everywhere. You know, there's something good everywhere. And so it's really, I would encourage um, all of the Discovery Year students get out there and explore, you know, 
Because um, once you have a family, that's where your focus changes, right? So travel as much as you can when you're young and free, as they say. Yes. One of the favorite, there's a few comments that our, our students bring back every year from their travels, either domestic or, or international. And one of them that I always love is most students come back and say, you know what? People are actually really nice. I, I, people, I was surprised. Mm. People were helpful. People were, you know, were really generous. And and I think it's partially just because, again, social media, we don't see. It's all negative. Everyone's a jerk. Everyone's, you know, um, doing bad things. So I, that's a really cool thing for me to experience when they come back and they say, wow, people are yeah. good, you know? Yeah, people are good, you know? And I think that's another drawback for me for social media. People have this ability to hide on social media, you know, they're, and they, I don't believe that's a true authentic representation of us as people. You know, I, I think that true authentic representation is when you're looking for directions in downtown Bangkok and somebody with no English comes up and offers to help you, you know, that's brave. That's courageous. That's honest. And, and it's, it's wonderful. Like it's, I've never had an experience really where a one-on-one -on -one interaction is anything but pleasurable. You know, like it's, it's people want to be connected to other people and they want to help in general. Like, I, you know? Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Last question uh, to wrap up. Thank you. We could talk for days, but uh, I'd love to know as a parting word here for our audience, thinking about a good life, we call these good life conversations because, you know, we, we know statistically and, and anecdotally that a good life involves for most people, meaningful work, good relationships, exploration, connection, learning. So in the sense of, you know, our, our young people going out into the world and trying to build a good life, what, what advice would you offer them in that pursuit? I'm going to go back to my theme, which is to get to that true authentic person that already exists inside of you that just takes a little bit of discovery. Get there as soon as possible and stay there for your entire life. Um, putting that version of yourself out into the world, not the version that you think people want to see or that you think a boss wants to see or that you think somebody in your life wants to see, but putting your true authentic self into the world um, will only deliver um, positive outcomes for you. And so for me, the, the wisdom in the inner self journey um, is without limit. Very cool. Part two, we could talk about, you know, the um, authenticity with boundaries, which is a topic I think that we've gotten to. And, and Brene Brown mm. is someone who talks about that, right? And or maybe even not part two, but maybe just quickly for you, because I know you're someone who does that well. And I think it's perhaps a mistake to say just, you know, be because people misunderstand sometimes what that means. Just be yourself. And they think they, if they like to wear PJs, they should go to work in PJs. <laughs> but, so how do you, how do you, define That's this big. idea of authentic self plus boundaries yeah well i think i think it's authentic so self, self includes boundaries mm -hmm. i think if you have no boundaries that's not your true authentic self because you've left yourself open to um some of the things in the world that aren't healthy for you you mm -hmm. know so i i would argue that when i say authentic self i include the boundaries you know th there is a study in fact done by Brene brown and her team where they studied the most compassionate people in the world, right? And those co most compassionate people in the world were, you know, the likes of missionaries and, you know, people who ran shelters and things of this nature. And they found in the data that the most common element of the most compassionate people in the world was that they had strong, healthy, clear, stay-worthy boundaries, which I found to be quite interesting data so when i say true authentic self of course you have to have boundaries and maybe i was being presumptuous and not mentioning that but the point is is that you can't be authentic if you haven't created the boundaries that keep you healthy amazing i'm glad i asked because that's a really it's a great answer and um useful and perhaps thought-provoking for for young people who are listening to conceive of it that way so Spencer, thank you. As always, you know, we'll, we'll chat more, but uh, I hope this was an interesting and I'm sure it was conversation for our young people out there and anyone else who's listening. So thanks for joining. Uh, thanks for having me, Jay. It's always a pleasure. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Thanks for listening. And uh, we'll see you at the good life, next Good Life Conversation.